Right, Grant Dawson versus Bobby Green. I'm going to start off with the full men's card. So, starting off with Mateus Mendoka versus Nate Maness. I'm going with Mateus Mendoka to win the fight via first round KO. The reason I'm picking first round KO is Nate Maness has shown that he can be very flat footed and he applies a lot of forward pressure. If you do that against a guy who tries to explode in the pocket with no setup and is lunging at you trying to get a finish, you will get knocked out. And we have seen that Nate Maness's striking defense can be susceptible at times to be getting dropped. Like in the, what was his name? Tony Gravely got him early near the end of the first round. And I think Mateus Mendoka could do something similar, but in the later half of the fight. Because you look at that fight with Javid Basharat, that was a fight where Jared Basharat is very good at timing his setups. He won't just allow you to just catch him on the chin and lunge into range of those hooks and stuff. He's very good at sidestepping, staying outside so he can avoid eating them bombs early. He caught a few early, but he didn't eat anything significant which would knock him out. Nate Maness, on the other hand, has in the later half of the first round. And you look at that fight with, what was his name? I've forgotten, Umar Nurmagomedov. He was getting caught with a few kicks to the head and to the body. And that is because when he's flat footed, he hasn't got that much time to move because he isn't that fluid on the feet. So trying to avoid these kicks is very hard. And I think it won't be the kick that knocks him out. He'll get caught with either a left hook or a right hook and he'll get flatlined. Ayori Quileng, I don't know how to pronounce it, against Johnny Munoz. A lot of you are going with Johnny Munoz, which I understand. But I'm going with Eri Quileng to win the fight via decision. I did not like the way how Johnny Munoz fought in that last fight. It was a lot of trying to get in range, but then try and fail the takedown. Well, not try and fail it, but you failed the takedown and then look to pull guard. And yeah, pulling guard can be effective when you're like Charles Oliveira or like an extremely high ADCC or like a very good jiu-jitsu offensive off your back guy, which you would have thought Johnny Munoz was. Which he is, he's got a few arm bars in his record, he's got a heel hook which is quite hard to get. But when you come to the UFC and you're fighting higher up position who they know how to defend against people who are pulling guard most of the time, it's easy to defend against. So therefore, Daniel Santos easily was able to defend against it. And I think Eri Quillen can as well. Because although we've seen him struggle against some grapplers in the past, like Cody Durden, he's struggling to the elite grapplers. Like Cody Durden, severely underrated, in my opinion. I've picked him to win a lot. I know I don't get a medal for that, which is cringe, but I know. So... I think Eric Kuleng, he's got a base of grappling where he can do it, but he's more of a boxer. And he carries power, but he doesn't rush things. He takes his time. He usually relies on the setup before getting into range and then looking for the finish, therefore getting a knockout, but in a more timed focus. Instead of rushing into the pocket more like Mateus Mendoka looking for a finish all the time, the finish comes when it comes. Which is why you see he goes through a lot of decisions because he's very good at outboxing the opponent. But where it can go wrong is if he comes up against an elite grappler, which I don't think Johnny Munoz is. Munoz kind of like tries to hold you against the fence. And if that don't work, then like I mentioned before, try to pull guard and then look to submit you or do damage. But he can struggle. And because Eric Quilling, like I mentioned previously, can kind of grapple. And if you try and pull guard on him, he'll lay on top of you and he'll be able to do damage. And yes, I know it was the last fight looks horrible where... The guy who's very defensive, who I thought would have won via decision if he was going to win, I didn't pick him. He ended up sparking him. But I don't think Johnny Munoz has got that type of power at Bantamweight. He's a jiu-jitsu guy. He wants to kind of butt scoop and pull you down and be on bottom or be on top of you. But I think he'll struggle to do that and Eric Quileng will win via decision. Bill Algio versus Alexander Hernandez. I'm actually going with Bill Algio. I'm saying that about a good five years back would have sound ridiculous, but... Alexander Hernandez has fell off massively. You could argue he has lost the last three fights if he given Jim Miller the win. I'll probably have to watch that fight back again, but I still think he did just win that fight. He almost got choked out by him, remember, I believe, in like the second round or something. The bell saved him. Might be wrong, but I believe that's what happened. And Bill Aljo has got that like karate stance where Alexander Hernandez has got kind of a wide stance, not extremely wide, but more boxing focus, not that many leg kicks and... And I think Bill Algio will be able to chop up them legs because he's bouncing on the toes. It's going to be hard for 
a guy like Alexander Hernandez to blitz him in the pocket. But what he has to be careful about is having them hands down low. Because although being good on your feet is good at avoiding punches, all it takes is that one punch onto the chin because you've got your hands down where that could chin you and drop you in a fight. But he does kind of get away with it because he has got a very good chin. And you've got to remember, I say he's got a very good chin because look at the guys who he's beat. And they haven't all been by finishes. For example, he beat Joe Anderson Brito. That guy hits extremely hard, yet he's able to survive. Andre Philly again, another hard hitter, dropping people like, what's his name? Um, from England, Nathaniel Wood. That's what I'm talking about. He doesn't just fight cans who have got no power. He's fighting hard-hitting guys and he's able to withstand them and actually use the karate to actually blitz them. Plus using the grappling on the ground as well. So he's got that like Wonder Boy type of style. Nowhere near as good as him, by the way, obviously. But mixing grappling with that, with jujitsu, he could get Alexander Hernandez down and use some of the grappling and mix that up as well. So I am going to pick him to win via decision over Alexander Hernandez. Alexander Hernandez's best bet is to blitz him early, like he did to Benil Dariush, because he'll have his hands down, and try and surprise him early. Not use any setup, just rush at him. Well, not like run at him like Amanda Nunes and Peña, but I'm talking about. Get into the pocket quick, like he did against Benil Dariush, and blitz him. Apart from that, it's going to be hard to out-tactically out-strike him in this type of fight. It's a bad matchup for him. Felipe Linz versus Ayn Kutalaba. I'm going with Felipe Linz. I don't know why Ayan Kutalaba is quite a big favourite to win this fight. Well, not a moderate, actually. It's a slight favourite. By looking at the votes, a lot of people are going with Ayan Kutalaba. And the thing about Ayan Kutalaba is, good grappler, well, very good, but the problem is he's way too small for the weight class, and you're coming against a guy who's quite big for the weight class. You see where I'm coming from. Therefore, if you rely on grappling and not boxing against a guy like this, which Felipe Linz is already a very good grappler. This is a huge mismatch, I think, in my opinion. And I think Felipe Linz will get a KO over Ayan Kutalaba, but I'm very confident in this because I know he's 38 and you'll look at that and think, well, 38 against the 29 year old, usually the younger age wins, but I think this is a rare scenario where that won't happen because look what happens when Ayan Kutalaba is fighting guys much bigger than him in terms of in cage weight and height. He usually struggles and loses. And although Felipe Linz isn't like a giant in terms of height, he's much bigger in terms of size. Therefore, if you try and shoot on a takedown on him, he'll be able to defend against the takedowns. And we might even see a Paul Craig, Johnny Walker scenario. You try and shoot for the leg, Felipe Linz starts hammering away because he's able to withstand your grappling because you're not strong enough to take that guy down. Yeah, he could, hypothetically, but I don't think he'll be the guy to do it. And I think this will be quite a comfortable win for Felipe Linz. This could backfire massively because of age. But I do think, mainly because of the weight difference, that will be the difference. So, yeah, he beat Tanaboza, great. But again, he's not the hugest either. Not the hugest. He's not that huge either. And Felipe Linz is, I'm telling you. So, I do think... He might even take Ayan Kutalaba down, you never know. But I am going to pick him to beat Ayan Kutalaba via KO. Right, Drew Dober versus Ricky Glenn. This fight should be an obvious pick, but nowadays it feels like there's never an obvious pick. Because look at Israel Adesanya and Sean Strickland, for example. Huge underdog ends up winning. But I can't trust Ricky Glenn to win against Drew Dober. You're talking about a guy with a granite chin against a guy whose chin is very suspect. And Ricky Glenn, he's got very good technical boxing. But then again, how can I say he's got very good technical boxing when he got starched, he got whacked by Christos Yagos. And he's nothing special, 19 and 10. He's not really that good in my opinion, yet he was able to starch him like that so quick. And Ricky Glenn, the Grant Dawson fight as well, should have been a draw in my opinion. Like he can surprise you in fights, but he hasn't been that active. Drew Dober got finished by Matt Frivola, which you could call early, and I did pick Matt Frivola to beat him. I don't know why I'm bringing that up, I just am, but Drew Dober, in my opinion, is going to knock out Ricky Glenn. He's not going to be able to knock out Drew Dober. Drew Dober weren't even fully out of it. It's not a thing where he got dropped and he just got completely annihilated and finished. It weren't like that. He got dropped, he was still with it, and then the referee jumped in a bit too early, probably. 
But I do think Matt Frivola would have won that fight still, maybe by decision. But never mind. Ricky Glenn, in my opinion, he has got good cardio. But what I'm scared about him now is his head movement isn't there. Because he took a year and almost two years off. And that obviously took a toll on him because his reaction time weren't there. He weren't moving his head off the centre line. He weren't fighting like how a boxer would usually fight. He became very flat-footed and got starched and whacked. And against Drew Dober, Drew Dober will eat it all and he'll come forward, relentless pressure, and look for the finish with power, leg kick you, which are quite underrated as the leg kicks on a flat-footed boxer. Perfect matchup. Yeah, I think he's going to knock him out. Although you've seen in the Ricky Glenn and Grant Dawson fight, he was able to grind his way to the third round and then get on top of him and land ground and pound. Won't be able to do it to Drew Dober. Drew Dober isn't bad at jiu-jitsu. The only thing is he loses to guys with great jiu-jitsu. Well, three of them anyway. Olivier Obin, Maser, Benil Darius, Islam Makashev. You're not really going to complain and say, oh, he has bad jiu-jitsu. They're world class at jiu-jitsu. Well, maybe not Olivier Obin, Maser, but them two were. Right, Yaquim Buckley versus Alex Morono. And the reason I call him Yaquim Buckley is because there's a Spanish footballer called Yaquim. That's why I call him that. So, who am I going with? I'm going with Yaquim Buckley to win the fight via KO in the first round. This could backfire horribly because I can see a Alex Morono decision or because Buckley is so wild and aggressive that he might get caught in a submission, a bit like Tim Means where... I don't know what he was thinking going for takedowns on Alex Morona. I doubt Yaquim Buckley would do that. But he was getting pieced up in the first round by Tim Means at 38. Who has got very good technical dirty boxing. But you look at a guy like Yaquim Buckley. And if you put him in that situation where Tim Means was in. He would have got the knockout because he carries more power than Tim Means. Tim Means' problem was... He was doing the right thing, but he didn't have the power to put him away. And then he started getting a bit excited and then looking for takedowns. So that won't work against a guy like Alex Morona, who has got extremely good jiu-jitsu. And Yalcom Buckley never been submitted before. On the feet, he's quite questionable at times. And Alex Morona has showed that he actually can bottle fights. Like the last two fights, he didn't look too good in them. Well, actually, I'd be wrong. I don't know why I said that. He actually did look quite good in the Santiago thing before the knockout. Never mind, outboxing him. But then you've got to remember, fighters who don't have the greatest chin, when they come up against power punches, you have to be wary of it. And Yaquin Buckley has extremely high power as well. Getting caught with an overhand right. That's why I can see either an overhand right, a kick by Yaquin Buckley, which knocks out Alex Morono. And I know Yaquin Buckley's on worse form, and he shouldn't be a moderate favourite. He should be a slight favourite. But Alex Morona has showed me now on numerous amounts of times his boxing ain't that great when he comes up against a proper boxer who's of a young age. Santiago Ponzinibbio, remember, he looks good in that fight, but he looks old and he's finished at that point. He was washed at that point. There's a lot of questions about how good is he, but I do think this fight might be perfect for him to get a knockout because now he doesn't really rush things. He takes his time. And if you take your time against a guy like Morona, and you don't do anything stupid like shooting on him or doing anything like that, reckless. As long as he don't shoot on him, I think he should be fine. And as long as he don't throw any jumping, spinning back kick. I know it worked on Impact Kasasangi, but it will not work on this guy. Just do not give away your back and stay at range and be patient like you were in the first fight. And fight the fight like you want to make it to a decision. And maybe be a bit more reckless in the last round is the way to beat Morono in this fight. Because... Like, fights with Moroni can drift if it's not going well, but he's that type of guy when, when it's not going well, he can pull something out. And he did that against um, Tim Means, but against Santiago Ponzinibbio, who's old and washed at that point. He got starched. But then again, he was doing well before that, but I have to pick Yalquin Buckley to win the fight via KO. Right, here's the next fight. Joe Pye for co-main event, which is good. He needs the money badly, and I'm glad Dana White put him in a co-main event. Abdul Razak Al Hassan. I've got to pick Joe Pfeiffer to beat him. This is one where I think the youthfulness will help him. He has not too, too much damage in his career. And Abdul Harak Hassan has had a lot of damage. He likes to scrap in the pocket. He's very aggressive. And Joe Pfeiffer is very calculated. He's very good at counter striking. And Abdul Al Razak Hassan, I think how he will fight the fight is how he fought against Claudio Ribeiro. He's going to look to clinch on top of him, try and hold him against the cage so he can't use that power shot, use that overhand right, 
which he likes to use a lot. But he will be vulnerable to being caught with that counter hand because if you rush into the pocket and look to grab hold of him, Joe Pfeiffer is strong. He ain't one of those weak middleweights who, if you just hold him against the cage, you won't be able to do anything. He will be able to outmuscle him in the clinch. Although I know Abdul Razak Al Hassan is very strong. And also, didn't he be, what was his name? I need to have a quick look. That's it, Eric Anders and Gerald Mearshart in grappling. He's beaten people at what they are good at. He shouldn't be beating Gerald Mearshart in a grappling competition. And he shouldn't be beating Eric Anders in a grappling competition. That just shows you how good his grappling really is. He had that one loss against Stolfus where the arm snapped because he tried to posture as he was getting thrown down to the ground. I don't think he has to worry about the striking, although he's got power, because I think he'll leave his chin wide open when Abdel Razak Al Hassan swings. Joe Pfeiffer has got loads of power, but he doesn't really swing. He throws a lot of like straight punches, left hooks, but they're not like thrown from a wide position, tight to his guard, throws them from a short distance, and is able to generate a lot of power by doing that. Therefore, I'm picking him to win via KO in the second round. Right, Bobby Green versus Grant Dawson. Before, it sounds stupid, I was thinking Bobby Green could win the fight, but then I looked at reality. Grant Dawson should win the fight via first round submission. Well, maybe not first round, but second to third. Anything past that, Bobby Green has a chance because he's got his hands down, won't be using as much cardio unless Grant Dawson drains him in the earlier rounds like he did to Demir Azmigulov. But... Bobby Green, the reason I gave him the chance was before, when you have your hands down against a guy who's going to be constantly shooting, you're going to see the takedowns coming from a mile away, your hands are not at your guard and they're lower down which makes it easier to sprawl and posture downwards, but the only negative is Grant Dawson is so much stronger than him, he's younger than him, yeah Bobby Green beat Tony Ferguson, but I'm saying even now Jim Miller would beat Tony Ferguson which is very unfortunate but it's the way it is and Bobby Green he has looked good in his last three fights I know he lost to Drew Dober but he was piecing him up on the feet before that I made a breakdown on that and he was also doing all right against Jared Gordon for the first I'd say minute and then after that Jared Gordon started taking over catching him with that overhand right like he kept catching Paddy Pimblett with but then the headbutt happened and he was very disappointed. He thought he should have been given the win. No, he shouldn't because there was a headbutt like you're a bull driving into his skull. And before that fight, I believe he said, no matter what happens, he was probably going to retire. It was a no contest. Therefore, he wanted to fight Tony Ferguson, beat him. And I believe that might have added like a spark of confidence thinking if he beats Grant Dawson, he ain't going to retire. I think if he loses the fight, he will retire. And I don't know how serious it will take training because remember, Bobby Green was thinking about retiring before the Jared Gordon fight. That was about four months ago. Grant Dawson is young. He wants to fight higher up in the rankings and he called out Ferguson a while back, but that fight will never happen now. We all know what would happen. Submission, easy. Because Demir Esmigulov has got extremely good takedown defense, but he made him look like an amateur. And Demir, I know he was holding up that tight guard, making it harder for him to time the takedown of Grant Dawson. But when he was on the ground, it weren't like, oh, he was doing nothing. He was doing all sorts of advanced high level ADCC folk wrestling. I don't know what word to use to describe how elite that grappling was on the ground. Getting Demir in a full Nelson on the ground. It looked like he was trolling him with the grappling on the ground. No one does that to Demir Esmagulov, not even a guy like Armin Sarukian. I know he kept taking him down over and over again, but he weren't putting him in positions like that. Like when Grant Dawson got him down, he was holding him down for the whole round. Against Armin Sarukian, you'd see him bounce back up to the feet and Armin Sarukian would still have hold of him. Grant Dawson is just one of those lightweights where he's very strong, but the only problem is... His grappling style revolves using a lot of cardio and that's why I'm thinking in a five round fight, if it goes past the fourth round, it goes in Bobby Green's favour. As long as the cardio was not being gassed out from the previous rounds because we saw in the Ricky Glenn fight, of all people, Ricky Glenn, a guy who's unranked, who's inactive, was able to take advantage of the cardio disparity 
and then land damage and get a 10-8 in the last round. Well, it should have been. Therefore, it should have been a draw, which sounds stupid to think about that. Ricky Glenn of all people, but that's where styles meet. Matchup happens. I don't know why I'm saying it should have been a draw. Yes, it was a draw. I don't know why I keep saying that. Yeah, I know it was a draw. I just forgot for one weird minute. And yeah, I think Bobby Green will get retired by Grant Dawson and it will break him into the top 10. I think he's already like in the top 15. And if he beats him, then you've got to look at him fighting much lower down. 20 and 1, fighting a lot of good opponents already. Like, just go through the record of who he's beaten already. Julian Arosa, who has got a bad chin, but Grant Dawson don't have power. Michael Trezano, Derek Minna, another great jiu-jitsu guy. Nad Niramani, the guy who outstruck Paddy Pimblett and beat him. Leonardo Santos by Hammerfist. I know it was in like the last second of the last round. But Leonardo Santos is a great jiu-jitsu guy. Gets the draw with Ricky Glenn. Jared Gordon, another good win to have on your record. Jared Gordon's a solid opponent with good cardio, good power. Mark Madsen, Olympic, I believe, gold wrestler. He might not have been, but he was a very good Olympic grappler. Demiris Magulov. These wins aren't just a bunch of can crushers. A lot of them are very good opposition. That's why I think Grant Dawson is very underrated. And I think he'll beat Bobby Green. So, yeah. Thank you for watching. Talk to you soon.